All right. <clears throat> Last time we went over uh, an example of a car rental company that might be keeping track of its cars. And we said they wanted to keep track of it for, uh, they wanted to keep track of a couple things specifically. Um, they wanted to keep track of the maintenance history of the car so that they could determine whether a car was due for an oil change or any other kind of, of uh, maintenance. They wanted to keep track of who had the cars on rent in case there were legal inquiries. Um, you know, that you know, maybe a parking ticket was received for a certain car on a certain day. And for all these reasons, all right, for all these reasons, um, we came up with an ERD that, that would um, model this. And this is what we came up with. All right, let's look <coughs> at the different elements of this. We have our automobiles, all right. One of the things that we said is that this car rental company had branches. That branch hires different employees. Um, cars can be rented by customers. One thing that you'll see sometimes on ERDs uh, are verbs written between them that sort of explains the relationship. And again, I'm going to talk a little bit about ERDs and maybe a little bit of the variance that, that I do versus what the book does. But what they might do, for example, is they might write a customer rents a car. So they might write the word rent there just to give a deeper understanding of exactly what's going on. All right. Our car. We have many pieces of maintenance that could be performed on that car. And each of those maintenance relates to a specific maintenance procedure that we want to track. Finally, cars have models associated with them. So for example, a Ford Focus. Um, so Focus would be in the model table. Ford would be on the, in the make table because that model has a make associated with it. For each model, there could potentially be a recall. All right, if there's a problem with the brakes or steering or whatever, there could be a recall, or in fact, there could be many recalls for that automobile. And lastly, we had um, a, what we called uh, the legal inquiry to kind of make it a little more general. Originally, I think we called it the parking ticket table, but the legal inquiry, whereas the car was involved in something like maybe a parking ticket or maybe a hit and run accident or whatever. And we want to record that information so that we can look up against the rental table to find out who was running the car at that point in time. So that's where we left off last time. Any questions about this? I want to do a couple things today. Um, first thing I want to do is I've gotten a couple questions, again, both online and, and on class about some of the differences between my ERDs and the ERDs that they show in the book. I tend to, to make my ERDs fairly simple, all right? Uh, but other information can be included, and they do that in the examples in the book. And I want to talk about them and sort of apply their notation, their, their sort of enhanced notation to some of the ERDs, that, uh, some of the elements of the ERD that we have here. Um, we've talked about all of the concepts, all the additional concepts, I think, but we may not have used the same words. So I want to sort of show what we've talked about and how it relates to what they've talked about in the book. And why it's even important to, to identify if something is a optional relationship or a mandatory relationship or a weak relationship versus a strong relationship. All right? Those are some of the things that they indicate on their ERD that I, I don't, all right? First of all, they indicate a little more detail about the cardinality by showing both a minimum and maximum. So for example, between car and legal inquiry. they would probably show it like this. I would think. 
again, there's, a, there's subtle differences in, in how people do ERDs, but I believe they'd show it like this. And whereas I just showed it sort of in a simplified form like this. Well, what is the difference between these two? Well, they indicate that every legal inquiry, what this means is it will have one and exactly one car associated with it. So a parking ticket isn't going to come in about two automobiles. A parking ticket won't come in about no automobiles, right? A parking ticket is always about exactly one automobile. And that's designated with the two lines here. If it was optional, which it kind of doesn't make sense in this case, but if it was optional, it would be shown like this. It could be zero or one. Now, down here, what this means is there can be zero through many legal inquiries about a given automobile, right? It's possible that a car never gets a parking ticket. You know, one of our rental cars may never get a parking ticket or be involved in a hit and run accident or be involved in a bank robbery or anything like that, right? A car doesn't have to have any legal inquiries about it, but by the same token, a car could have one or two or three or many. So that's why we show a zero here. And that would indicate that there's zero through many legal inquiries for that car. This is just a little bit of additional information that you can show via the ERD. All right. Yeah, it means that there has to be one. For example, let's look at let's look at this. Let's look at the relationship between branch and employee that we defined before. All right, that might look like that, right? Why? Well, because um, an employee works for one and exactly one branch. And a branch has to have at least one employee, right? And it could potentially have many. You're not going to have any. Uh, you're not going to have any uh, branches with uh, zero employees that run themselves. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Now there is sort of a uh, a, a twist on this where you have what's called optional becoming mandatory. All right. And optional becoming mandatory might be something like this. Let's say, and we'll deviate from the, the school example or the, the auto rental example to consider uh, a school example. Faculty advises many students. Each student has a faculty advisor. Well, Maybe a student isn't initially assigned a faculty advisor. Maybe the first day they register, um, they're unassigned. And maybe then later on after they decide a major or at a certain point of their college education, will they be assigned an advisor. So by the time they're done, they're going to have an advisor, but they won't necessarily have one the first day. And that's called optional becoming mandatory. All right, and again, uh, I don't think the textbook differentiates between optional and optional becoming mandatory. All right, because you have to make it optional. Right? Uh, there's nothing we can do in the database to enforce that becoming mandatory piece of it. You know, if it's optional, it's optional. Um, we'd have to have other controls built within our applications to make sure that at a certain point. We found all the students that were juniors, let's say, that didn't have a faculty advisor. But that's not something that we could, that's not a control we could build into the database. Now, what's the implication of this? This is all fine and well and good. And, you know, now if you're on Jeopardy and the category is ERDs, you know, you might be able to answer a few more of the questions. But what is the importance of it? All right. 
the importance of it relates to, especially uh, relates to when you consider where you're gonna, whether you're going to make a field required or not. All right. Um, especially when the optional is on the one side of the relationship. When the optional is on the many side of the relationship, um, there, there, isn't, there isn't the exact same implication. But when the, when, the, when the optional part is on the one side of the relationship, like you have here, then what that means is, in the student table, faculty ID would, could not be a required field. All right. So when you're defining those fields, you are going to define a foreign key between the faculty and student. However, however, you could not make that field of faculty ID required in the student table. So if you were making it, uh, if you were entering it in, you'd have to answer no to required for that. So that's what that optional largely means. All right. Especially again, if you're talking about on the one side of a one to many. That means that that foreign key is going to be optional. All right. The other thing that they talk about in the book, and I've, I've seen slightly different uh, takes on this, just doing a little bit of, of research, but they talk about strong and weak entities, and they talk about identifying relationships. All right. Essentially, a strong entity is an entity that would exist even if its, quote, parent disappeared. And we could look at faculty and student. All right. Both of them are strong entities. Why do I say that? Well, if the faculty person that advises a student were to retire and be deleted out of the faculty table, the student doesn't just then disappear, right? The student has an existence beyond this relationship, all right? The identifying part comes in, this would be an example of a weak, or I'm sorry, these would both be strong entities and they have a non-identifying relationship because the student, primary key of the student does not contain the faculty ID as part of the key. So that's what they mean by a non-identifying relationship. Um, given the fact that we often use auto number keys, that's partly a moot point, but we, we'll focus instead on weak and, and strong entities as opposed to the identifying part. Because that identifying part kind of becomes a moot point if you're using, um, if you're using um, auto number keys. Now, We'll be an example of a weak entity. Let's go and look at the automobile example again. An example of a weak entity would be this maintenance history on the car. Right? Let me isolate that part of the diagram where we have an automobile We have, I think I call it the maintenance performed, but it's really the auto's um, maintenance history. And then there's a relationship to the maintenance procedure table. This is an example of a weak entity. Why is that an example of a weak entity? If that car disappears, what do we care about the maintenance history for it? That maintenance history depends on the fact that that car is there. Without that car, that maintenance history is meaningless. All right? That's different than stu the, the, the other relationship that we, show, that, that we showed here between student and faculty. If that faculty member disappears, that student still exists, right? That student will simply get another faculty advisor, or maybe they won't have a faculty advisor temporarily until they find a new one, 
All right? But those are both real strong entities. To be sure there's a relationship between them, faculty students are advised, oh, I'm sorry, students are advised by faculty members, but if that faculty member goes away, the student doesn't disappear. So those are both strong entities. In this case, however, if that car disappears, it's not like we go and transfer its maintenance history to another vehicle. All right, gee, we don't have that car anymore. Oh, I guess that oil change was done on this car then. You know, it doesn't even make sense to think of it that way. If the car disappears, the maintenance history goes with it. All right? Now, what do you think the implication of that is? That's all well and good. Now we know what strong and weak entities are. And again, identifying entity means part of the parent's keys and the, the, the other key, which again, with auto number keys, that becomes less important. What do you think the implication of whether something's a strong or weak entity is? Where does that come into play? Cascade exactly. The cascade delete. All right. Remember, what does the cascade delete say? The cascade delete says that if I delete the parent, do I delete the rows in the children table? So, and we'll go in and we'll define this and, and a few other things in a, in a few minutes here. But if I delete this automobile, do I want to delete the maintenance history with it? And yeah, if, if, if we get rid of that automobile, yeah, that maintenance history is, is uh, you know, is gone. So we would go in and, and we would uh, delete it. Now, that's not necessarily the only factor, but that's where the implication is. You definitely would not delete a strong entity in a foreign key relationship. So, for example, if I were to delete a faculty member, I definitely would not delete the students associated with a faculty member, right? Now, there may be cases where even a weak entity you don't want to cascade for some other reasons. But there's at least a potential to cascade if you have a weak entity, all right? Because you no longer need this. You know, if I get rid of the automobile, I really don't need the maintenance history. If I don't have the car anymore, I don't care when the last oil change was done, you know? Another example of this, a classic example of this, is where you have an order that has a bunch of items on it. Let's say we're ordering something from some place and we place our order and we order two of these, three of these, five of these, and so on. This order item is a weak entity, right? It doesn't make any sense to have that if we don't have the order that it belongs to. If we go in and delete the order, we might as well delete all the items associated with it uh, as well because those items don't really mean anything without it. So that would be another example of a weak entity. Let's look at our car diagram and try to identify weak and strong entities. What about employee? An employee has a relationship to a branch. Is that a weak or a strong entity? employee? Weak? Why, why would you say weak? So you could delete the employee. You still have the branch. Well, I guess it's really a strong... Right, exactly. What, your explanation was correct, but the first way you identified it, you said it is weak, yeah. Uh, both of them would be strong entities, branch and employee, right? Because if the employee goes away, the branch certainly doesn't go away, right? And the reverse is true, too. If the branch went away, the employee doesn't necessarily go away, right? They could potentially transfer that employee to another branch or whatever, all right? So those two things really, they do have a relationship, but each one of them sort of has, you know, a life of its own. I, I guess, you know, um, 
besides talking about this in formal database terms and relationships and cascading deletes and all this, you know, think of it. Does it have a life of its own? Does it, <laughs> does it live beyond when uh, the, the related table goes away? What about car and legal inquiries? Legal inquiries. Is that a strong or a weak entity? Weak. We don't have that car anymore. We don't care where the parking tickets were for it. All right. Without that car, that parking ticket doesn't make any sense at all. So that would be a weak entity. Questions. And, and uh, again, if I remember right, they show the difference between a weak and a strong entity with uh, or a, a relationship with a dash line versus a solid line. I think in the book. Yeah. Let's look at some of the cardinalities here. We have defined here that a car has a one-to-many relationship with the maintenance performed or the, the maintenance history. What's the minimum cardinality on the maintenance performed? Or do we already do this one? No, we didn't do this one. Is it possible for a car to have no maintenance performed on it. Yeah. Now you could argue that that's one of those man, uh, optional becoming mandatory. That is, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have any maintenance initially, but at some point it's probably a good idea for you to. But yeah, that's an optional maintenance. Now, would I have a maintenance performed or a maintenance history row without an automobile associated with it? No. So if we're going to draw this like in the book, we'd, we'd draw it like that. Is it possible to have a maintenance procedure that doesn't have a particular maintenance history associated with it? Yeah. Is there a maintenance performed that doesn't correspond to one of our defined maintenance procedures? No. So it would look like that. All right, I hope that clarifies some of the differences between the two and really points to the reason why, why we do that and why that that's important. And again, you know, you can show it on the ERD like they do it in the book. Um, but the real important thing comes to knowing that when you go to implement the database and knowing how to set those things up um, when you define the database. All right. Let's go and let's look at some of these tables and... Let's associate some attributes with this. Let's build maybe a pieces of this database at a time. And let's start with these tables here. Let's start with these five tables here. And let's build those tables in Access. And let's implement the relationships and maybe do some forms or, re or, or reports or, or whatever. So. The tables I want, I want the make table, the model table, the automobile table or the car table, the maintenance history table, and the maintenance procedure table. I'm going to start first off by making the assumption that for all of these we're going to use the auto number keys. All right. It's probably a good idea. We could look at what some of the other candidate keys are. All right. Uh, manufacturer name, for example, would be a, 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 a candidate key in the make table. All right. You know, because there aren't two car companies called Ford. There aren't two car companies called General Motors or whatever. So that could be. But, again, for all the reasons that we gave before, we're going to use an auto number. All right? Auto numbers are smaller to store. All right? And we know that they're going to be unique, and we can, we can ensure that everyone has one. So, regardless of that, we're going to go and we're going to make that the primary key of each of the table. So, I'll just put that in right from the start. That the primary key is make ID, 
model ID, car ID, maintenance history ID, and maintenance procedure ID. I'll use sort of my standard notation of the asterisk indicating primary key, the double asterisk indicating a foreign key. Now, we talked last time about candidate keys, all right? And candidate keys in the automobile table would be the VIN number, vehicle identification number, and would be the combination of state and plate number. Because either of those two things would be potentially enough to identify a car. If you know the car's serial number, you know what car it is. If you know the plate and state, you know what year it is. Oh, I'm sorry, you know what car it is. What are we going to do with those candidate keys when we, put, when we create those fields? We're going to make unique indexes on them, all right, which will prevent duplication of, of those fields being put in. Now, what are some other uh, attributes that would have in the automobile table? Let's look at that. What's well, one for sure? We're going to want the model ID, right? Because there's a one-to-many relationship between model and car. Therefore, the car has to point to the model that it belongs to. So therefore, I'll put the model ID as a foreign key in the car table. What are some other attributes that we could put in there? Well, that won't, be a, that won't be an attribute of the car, right? Because remember, there's a whole bunch of maintenance history that's been performed on the car. So that won't be part of the car table. That will actually be a part of that table. Well, do we need the make ID? Well, yeah, we need the model ID, but... The make ID is a derivable field, because if we know the model, we can identify the make. I'm thinking of things like the year, maybe the color. Um, you know, uh, what, what would you call that? Body type, whether it's a four-door or two-door. We could list a, a bunch of attributes, but I think that's enough for, for now. Um, Actually, we could complicate things a little bit if we wanted to by including the year as a separate table. All right. Why? Well, because certain models only exist for certain years. Right? There isn't a 2011. I'm trying to think of an old car. Uh, yeah, there. Yeah, there isn't a 2011 Model T. All right, or Model A, or whatever. So therefore, not that you would be renting an old one either, but at any rate, certain models only exist for certain years. And you could build that in there, but we're going to take a shortcut on this one, all right, and, and, and I'll put that in there. Now, the model ID would probably have the name of the model in it. Make would have the name. I would think both of these would be candidate keys. I'll put little boxes around candidate keys. Because I could, again, store, instead of an ID, I could store Ford or Toyota. And instead of a model ID, I could store Focus or Corolla or Camry or whatever. But I've chosen to make it a numeric ID. All right? But still, it's a candidate key. Now, the maintenance procedure table will have a list of all the maintenances we can perform. And so there's going to be an ID for that. There will be a description of, the, uh, of that. And there'll be a frequency. And we said, in this example, the frequency would be defined as the number of months that we want to do this procedure. So like if we wanted to do it every six months, would have six months. And would have the value of six in there. Maintenance history then, this is again where we connect the maintenance 
history, or yeah, the maintenance history is where we connect the maintenance procedure and the car. So we're going to need a maintenance procedure ID as a foreign key, a car ID as a foreign key, and the date that it was per performed. So we can keep track of that. Now we could probably add some attributes to this if we wanted to get fancy or more involved. We could involve, uh, we could create a body shot or a, a mechanics table of who did the service. You know, if we took it for an oil change to this place versus that place. Um, we could include a lot of other information, but this I think is, is enough to uh, do this, uh, do what we want to do. Now, what I want to do in this is I want to go and establish the, the tables for this, keeping into account all those things that we've talked about, the candidate keys, the strong relationships, the weak relationships. Um, and uh, whether, whether, whether the relationship is optional or not. All right? So we'll construct our tables just like we've done before, but maybe with a little bit more care because we'll, we'll consider those things. Then we're going to have a model. We're going to have our sort of prototype database of at least part of this application. We can go in and we can make sure that we can put the data in. Because right? if we can't put the data in right, we haven't defined something correctly. We'll go through and we'll run through some typical scenarios. Okay, you know, here's a car, it's a Ford Focus, and I have an oil change on this date and a tire rotation on that date. Can I enter that into the database? If the answer is no, I can enter that in, guess what? You define the database wrong because you're having a real scenario that you're trying to put into your data model. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't go in there well, then something isn't defined correctly. So, let's go and define this database in access. I caught myself so that one doesn't count. All right. Okay, let's go in and let's put the tables in. Put in the make table. Primary key is going to be a make ID. The make name, text. And because this was a candidate key, right, we could have made this a primary key of this table. We are going to go and we are going to say it's required and is indexed and no duplicates are allowed. That way we can't put in the Ford Motor Company twice or GM twice or Toyota twice, all right? And likewise, we can't put in a make that doesn't have a name associated with it. Remember, <clears throat> you want to build as many constraints in your database as is possible, as is realistic, to prevent bad data from going in. Remember the diagram that I showed way back in, I don't know, towards the beginning of class. The database There's a program that accesses the database, a DBMS. And any program that wants to do something to the database has to go through the DBMS. All right? So any rule that I want to have about the database, if I can store it in the database itself, then the DBMS will enforce that rule. So that's why we set up foreign keys. I could try to write each one of these programs to enforce the foreign key rules and the required field rules and all that. But do I want to have to get something right four times or get something right once? Well, I want to get it right once. And then any application that accesses that data, those rules will be applied. So that's why, I'm, that's why it's so important 
to really create your data model correctly and understand the optional relationships and the candidate keys and the weak and strong entities so you can create these with the proper constraints on them so that when you create the database, those constraints are enforced regardless of who tries to access the data. Okay, so that's it for the make table. Model table will be approximately the same thing. Except again, that's also a candidate key in this table, so we'll make it required. And we'll make it a unique index. The one thing we forgot when we sketch this up here is that in the model table we need the make ID as a foreign key. Now, this is where, so let's go and add that. We need the make ID. This is where the indication of whether that's an optional relationship or not becomes important. The relationship between make and model. You know, we're not going to have a manufacturer that doesn't manufacture a model, so it's required on that end. Likewise, we're going to have, not going to have a model that doesn't have a manufacturer associated with it, so it's required on that end as well. So, what does that mean? All right. That means when we go and define this in the database table, make ID, we make a required field. All right. And, again, we, it's going to be indexed, but we're going to allow duplicates because, again, a, there can be more than one model for a given make. If we made this where uh, uh, it, it, duplicates were not allowed, then we couldn't have two models for a given make. So Ford could only make one model, and that's, that's not correct. So, again, all those things that the book talks about that I've talked about maybe in a different fashion do come into play when you actually create the database because you need to know do I need to make this a required field or not? Do I need to make this uh, a unique index or not a unique index? All right. Let's come from the other end and create the maintenance uh, tables. And for simplicity I'm just going to call the one table procedures. Procedure name, we should require it, right? And we should make sure it's unique. Because we could use a procedure name as a, as a candidate key, right? We could, we could have said, instead of having a procedure ID, we could have had oil change as a primary key, the, the name of the procedure. But again, it's better not to. Frequency, do we want to make that required? Probably, yeah. The whole point of this is that there's this is certain regular preventive maintenance that we want to perform on a certain schedule. So if we define a procedure and not define the schedule for it or how often we want it done, it probably isn't going to benefit anything. So yes, we will make that required. All right. Let's now go in and create the automobile table. Automobile ID. Usually I try to make the convention again of whatever the table name is, the primary key is table name ID if I'm using auto numbers. We did say the VIN number is one of the candidate keys. 
which is text. And there was a student last time that knew how long they were. I think he said they were 26 characters. They're long, all right? If you imagine that this is used to identify every car in the world, you know, yeah, it's going to be more than a couple numbers. It is going to be required, yes. And it is going to be indexed and no duplicates, right? Because, again, it's a candidate key. This could have been the primary key. The indexing will help us because, let's say, for example, we get a parking ticket. They're not going to know our automobile number, the, the, the sheriff or whoever writes a parking ticket, but they might be able to see the VIN number on the dash, or they might know the state and plate. All right, so they would put that in. Yes? What is allow zero length? Allow zero length. There's a subtle difference between a null and an empty string, all right? And a null is no value. And an empty string is a value that contains no characters. Uh, I'm trying to think of a practical example of where you would you would allow zero length even though it's required. That's a good one. Let's, let's just Google that one real quick. I don't know. That's a real good question. Access allow zero length. If you want Microsoft Office to store a zero length string instead of a none when you enter a blank field, set both allow zero length and required property to yes. one thing I don't really like about a lot of documentation. I mean, that told me what it is, but it doesn't really tell me why you would want to do it. Um, why would you not want to have a null in there? It's different to say that a field has a blank value versus a null value. Let's give a goofy example. All right. Let's say the field I'm, I'm interested in is middle initial. All right, person's middle initial. Some people don't have middle names, right? So I couldn't, I couldn't make it absolutely required. So I would say that it's required. And if I said allow zero uh, length string, then everyone would have some value for their middle initial and no one would have a null. Now there's a difference between a null and no value. If, for example, I allowed nulls and counted everyone's middle initial in the employee table or whatever, it would not include people who had a null middle initial. If I allowed an empty string, it would include those people. So a null is like, like a, like a not applicable, there's no value here. Where an empty string is sort of just like a, a, a no, you know, um, uh, an empty value as opposed to no value at all. And so if I was counting the number of rows that had a middle initial, one would return everyone. If I allowed a zero string, one would um, exclude people that didn't have a middle initial. That's the implication of it. Why you'd choose to do one or the other, I don't know. Sounds like they're being a troublemaker. <laughs> good, good question. All right. Um, let's 
state and plate. We'll make both of these required. And I can't really create an index for, one, for both of these together because really both of them together is your plate ID, right? You know, your plate, ABC123, another car could have in Idaho or whatever. So I would have to go here and, let's see, go up to indexes. And then I could define a new index for state, or we'll call it state plate, the index name, that consists of the state and the plate together. What that will do is that will allow me to create one index that consists of two different fields. And I can say that index needs to be unique. All right, well, the other things I had, I needed a model ID, which is a number. And it's required, right? We can't have a car that is not associated with a model. Then we had a year, oops, and a color, oh, yeah, actually to create the index you just put it on one of the fields and if there's no index name, it takes it from the one above it. There we go. All right. So now I'll go and I'll create the, we'll just call this the history table for the maintenance history. And this will have an automobile ID. That will be a number, a procedure ID that will have a number, and the date performed, that will be a date. All right. I'd like to go in and at least create the foreign keys here and save this, and then um, we'll, we'll see uh, Probably next week we'll do at least something with the forms and reports of this. I guess my, my bigger point is in creating this, notice how I paid attention to those things, whether it's optional or required or whatever. All right, whether it's a weak, and now when we make the, 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 the foreign keys, we'll consider whether it's a weak or a strong entity. I'm going to go and arrange this, these tables to kind of look like our ERD. I'll just create the foreign keys now. It's, our, our time is just about up. We'll leave the discussion of whether to cascade uh, delete or not. We'll leave that until next time because um, this could go a while. Because even with weak entities, just because it's a weak entity doesn't mean you want to cascade delete. I mean, if I have a car, if I have a car out here for a make, if I try to delete that make, I don't necessarily want to take all the cars out with it. Remember also when you cascade, the cascade can go all the way down. 
In other words, I could cascade delete from here to here and here to here. And therefore, by deleting a make, it will delete all the models. Deleting the models will delete all the automobiles for a given make. So I want to be careful about that. So I don't want to rush through this one. I will, however, in the name of completion, finish creating the foreign keys. And I won't say anything about cascading delete. And we'll come back to that um, next time. I'll save this. I will upload this example um, so that you can look at it and we'll build upon this example uh, in our uh, examination next week. All right, questions? All right, we'll see you in lab.